This time last year, 274 million people needed humanitarian assistance. And for 2023, that number has gone up again, bringing the number of people in need across the globe to 339 million, and a figure which is almost unreadable. From new conflicts in Gaza and Sudan to flooding in Libya and earthquakes in Syria and Turkey, humanitarian crises around the world drove more than 350 million people to need help in 2023, even more than the figure estimated at the start of the year. While funding to address those needs reached record levels, so too did the funding gap. Only one third of the $57 billion humanitarians appealed for was actually received. That's the largest funding shortfall in years. These are just some of this year's headlines as 2023 comes to a close. But seeing as this podcast is about how to rethink humanitarianism, we figured we'd take a look at which events this past year have forced a rethink in aid and how humanitarian response has changed most significantly in 2023. Have any lines been drawn in the sand? And how has 2023 been a turning point in the way aid is delivered, if at all? From Geneva, Switzerland, I'm Hiba Ali. And from Toronto, Canada, I'm Melissa Fendira. This is Rethinking Humanitarianism, a podcast about the future of aid in a world of rising crisis. So Heba, we're just a few weeks out from the end of the year. And looking back at what the year in humanitarian needs looked like, here are some of the things that have really stood out. This has been the deadliest year for civilians in nearly 20 years. Sudan and Gaza are two of the major conflicts that have really caused these numbers to spike. More than 12,000 people have been killed in Sudan since April, and it's still facing the largest displacement crisis in the world. 6.6 million people displaced. It's a staggering number. And in Gaza, more than 18,000 people have been killed just since the 7th of October. And of the 2.3 million people who live in the Gaza Strip, 85% of them have been displaced. Again, incredibly staggering numbers. And then, of course, climate change continues to be a major driver of humanitarian need. By the end of this year, it's expected to be the hottest year on record. And I'm pretty sure that there's no listener who hasn't experienced some form of climate-related destruction in their region, from cyclones and hurricanes to droughts and floods, wildfires, you name it. And then, of course, there are the economic drivers of humanitarian need, which have exacerbated crises in countries like Afghanistan and Venezuela. And I think it's exactly because of this grim picture that you've just laid out that we spend so much time on the podcast exploring new ideas to address humanitarian crises. And the sector is always full of them. This year was no exception. The grand bargain, this you know, infamous package of aid reforms was renewed um, in a new form. Martin Griffiths rolled out his new so-called flagship initiative that aims to empower country-level humanitarian leadership and make aid uh, less bureaucratic, nothing like um, a top-down reform process to do that. But we've also seen a number of bolder and more ambitious ideas for how to make countries better able to deal with crises when they do hit. We saw loss and damage fund really gain steam in in climate negotiations. We've seen momentum for an initiative that's being pushed by the Prime Minister of Barbados, Mia Motley, to uh, reform international financial institutions and make it easier for countries hit by climate crises to access financing at, at fairer rates. So there has been some movement. And since this podcast is in the business of rethinking humanitarianism, we wanted to drill down on that. What's actually changed this year for better or for worse? Mm -hmm. And we wanted to hear from as many people as possible. So we sent out a call out asking this question. If you didn't see this call out, dear listener, that's probably because you don't follow us (laughs) on social media. And I think it'd be a very good New Year's resolution to do so. So look for the new humanitarian on Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, And a big thank you to those of you who did answer that call out, and you'll be hearing some of those answers throughout the episode. So today we're joined by three guests to discuss the year that has been. Nazanin Moshiri is a senior analyst for climate, environment and conflict and Africa at the International Crisis Group. She joins us from Nairobi. Welcome, Nazanin. Thank you so much for having me. Rowan Loy is the senior policy editor for The New Humanitarian. He is also one of the hosts of the New Humanitarian's new podcast, What's Unsaid, which is amazing, and you should listen to it. It's a bi-weekly podcast that explores the open secrets and uncomfortable truths that often surround the world's conflicts and disasters. Erwin joins us today from Geneva. Welcome, Erwin. Hi, thanks for having me. 
And Dustin Barter is a senior research fellow at ODI's Humanitarian Policy Group. His work specializes in humanitarian system reform. Dustin joins us from Melbourne, hopefully with lots of coffee on hand. Welcome, Dustin. Thanks. Great to be here. So as it happens, we're recording this roundtable on the very last day of COP28. Uh, This year, humanitarianism was placed pretty firmly in the climate agenda. This was the very first time that a COP summit dedicated an entire day to humanitarian action. Nazanin, uh, you just came back from Dubai, where the summit was held. What was your main takeaway from 2023 when it comes to the intersection of climate change and humanitarianism? And what outcomes from COP will most likely change the way that aid is delivered moving forward? Yes. I mean, when I was there, I was there for the Peace, Relief and Recovery Day on December 3rd. Um, And there was a lot of enthusiasm, I have to say, around the fact that it was on the main agenda for the first time at a COP. And also because there was the approval and authorization of the loss and damage fund, which is supposed to support countries including those experiencing conflicts uh, that are suffering harm due to climate change. That happened on during the opening session of COP, uh, so on the first day. And just more generally, the feeling you got at this COP in particular was that there was an understanding that around half of the most climate vulnerable countries, and many of them were there, of course, at COP with big delegations, particularly countries from Africa, they are also grappling with conflict too. And also, speaking to humanitarians on the ground, there was a real feeling that you know many of the issues around fundraising that humanitarians are having, where fundraising has really fallen short, we also see that climate financing is falling short as well. And I think generally, you know, a crisis group and, and other people I've spoken to, what we're saying is that we don't think that increased funding alone is going to prevent further instability or protect you know, countries that are suffering from political strife or war and also the impact of climate change. But funding for climate adaptation and resilience is the best hope we have for warding off some of the most dismal potential outcomes. And there was a real sense that a lot of lot of us were on the same page about that at COP28. And of course, there was a declaration that was signed where um, a lot of organizations, uh, countries, including China, uh, including the US, signed this declaration on peace and also some multilateral organization, banks, etc., and NGOs such as ourselves signed the declaration. It's not legally binding, but we see it as a beginning. We see it as something that potentially puts this right front and center on the agenda at COP and hopefully at future COPs too. The sense is that this is the first time that COP is focusing on conflict-affected countries. There seems to be some enthusiasm around this declaration, as you mentioned. So how significant is it that this conversation around the intersection between climate and conflict has become so much more mainstream this year? It is pretty significant. We have found it quite difficult for those people who are pushing uh, for these kinds of indirect links uh, to be more on the agenda. We found it quite hard to find a space for our thinking, because um, obviously the obvious place would be the UN Security Council, which deals with matters of peace and security. But as you know, a few years ago, a resolution which was put forward by Ireland failed um, at the Security Council. So, So yes, we were pushing for this kind of recognition at COP. There's a sense that you know, far more obviously needs to be done, and particularly on the climate financing side. But again, it's a start. It's on the agenda now. Now that it's, you know, it's it's being spoken about, it's on the agenda. I mean, how hopeful are you that this is actually going to translate into some action? Do you think it'll actually have an impact on aid delivery? These are two very separate things, right? Um, Because obviously aid delivery is looking more at emergencies and more immediate needs. Whereas what we're talking about is, you know, climate financing, which is looking at building climate resilience, which is more akin to development. There should be, you know, a bridge between you know, what's happening now um, and the increased, you know, volatility that we're seeing in terms of climate effects, which are impacting countries that are at conflict as well. I don't think there's any coincidence there that, you know, climate fragility and conflict often go hand in hand in many countries, in the Horn of Africa, for example, in Somalia, also, you know, elsewhere in Afghanistan. 
and uh, South Sudan too, which has endured devastating floods. Perhaps there needs to be a bridge. And perhaps, yes, the humanitarian world could help bridge that funding gap, i.e., you know, if the humanitarians, in terms of their interventions, are thinking, you know, more along climate sensitive lines when they're carrying out programming, et cetera, and also conflict as well. So as I said, I think it's it's a beginning. You know, obviously it's just a declaration, it's not legally binding, but hopefully it could lead to more work on the ground. I mean, for me, what I'm watching is the approach to climate finance. These are very high level decisions, but for humanitarians, I think it represents a balance that they have to strike. And I don't think they've they've sort of understood that or or come to a decision collectively on what that actually means. So, for example, when we're talking about adaptation finance and um, how that will actually trickle down to countries experiencing conflict who have not seen enough, nearly enough adaptation finance. And if we're talking about humanitarians being through the triple nexus, quote unquote, where humanitarians and development actors are more joined up, if humanitarians are a little bit more responsible for working it into their programs, then are they the ones that are chasing the climate finance? Generally speaking, the humanitarian sector as a whole has been saying, no, uh, climate finance should be separate from the funds that we're looking for. But in practice, when you have individual aid groups in a very constrained environment needing lots of funding, um, there will be those funding opportunities. And many humanitarian development actors are already chasing climate finance. So I think there's a choice that they'll face in the, in the coming months about what to do about this money and can they actually just leave it on the table. And especially if, Nazanin, you're saying that the climate communities is feeling I got the sense almost threatened by humanitarians trying to eat up the money and the humanitarians are thinking that this is a new source of funding that they'll be able to access to do the work in these areas that there that um, there might be a bit of <laughs> tension and negotiation that needs to happen there. Absolutely. There is a bit of tension there, I have to say. There were a lot of humanitarian agency heads at COP28. Um, but when you speak to climate campaigners who have been pushing for a loss and damage fund for more than 20 years, they feel that there's just too much going on at COP now. Too many events, too many thematic days. They really wanted the focus to be on the creation of a loss and damage fund, which was created, and there are still a lot of issues around it, um, as we know, because it's going to be hosted by the World Bank. And also the funding is nowhere near the levels needed, although some countries have made some substantial pledges. But also the promises that were made to developing countries $100 billion a year still had not been fulfilled. So I think we're about $86 billion a year from the latest OECD figures. So yes, there is a tension there. And I, and I felt it when I was, was at COP. With, I think the climate finance is obviously excellent to be pursuing, but it kind of needs to go hand in hand also with debt relief. If we look at Pakistan and Somalia as indicative countries, Somalia has been going through the debt relief process over many, many years for approximately 4.6 billion USD in terms of debt relief, which that cripples the country from being able to build up governance, build up the role of the state, responding to humanitarian crises, responding to conflict. And so even for a country like Somalia, yes, enhancing and improving client finance is very helpful, but you also need to look at these structural barriers such as persistent debt from predatory lending, from times of crisis that we're not of the country's making necessarily. And this is not just Somalia, but also Pakistan and across uh, many countries in the global south. You have this structural barrier of debt that's lingering over and really exacerbated by COVID. So yeah, climate finance is excellent, but what about these deeper structures that kind of limit the ability for a country to govern effectively? And where do countries sit on, you know, accelerating debt relief, not just for a country here, a country there, but accelerating the process for a lot of countries, I think is a more systemic uh, way to addressing it hand in hand with climate finance, rather than just having the two kind of working against each other. If memory serves right, this time last year at COP27, one of the big conversations was around the Bridgetown agenda, which was pushed by Barbados Prime Minister Mia Motley, which addressed just that, Dustin, right? How to actually address the the debt ratio issue that climate affected countries are facing, uh, despite not having contributed to the to the climate crisis, is that a conversation that's continued in twenty twenty three? 
Uh, like I haven't seen that much on debt relief. You know, it had a, has the occasional flash in the pan when Bono speaks up about it, but then otherwise not really continuing in the way it should be. And when we link it with climate, it's like Pakistan, you had mass flooding very recently and has exacerbated uh, debt impacts and, you know, all the recovery costs there. And uh, yeah, I don't think it's been as in comprehensively or coherently linked to these broader issues around climate change. So yeah, I think that discussion needs to go a lot further. A lot of countries and creditors that aren't just bilateral are really dragging their feet on debt relief across many settings for no particularly good reason except wanting to maintain that debt in various forms. And interestingly, last year, Martin Griffiths really made a thing of debt relief and I think put it on the agenda in ways that it hadn't really been in the humanitarian sector. So the fact that that hasn't then kind of built up momentum in this direction is an interesting takeaway. Hello, my name is Mark Dubois. I'm an independent humanitarian consultant and I'm a senior fellow at SOAS, University of London. 2023 was another year where humanitarians faced really hard, really gut-wrenching decisions. I think it might be the year in which humanitarians finally recognize that what makes these decisions so difficult is that there are competing moral values, that there are ethical principles at stake, and even ethical dilemmas where there's no right choice. For a while now, there's been work on humanitarian ethics. You have Hugo Slim's great book from 2015, and a lot of research showing just how important systematic ethical thinking is to humanitarian action. At the same time, I don't think there's been much uptake, especially on the operational side. And right around mid-year, Humanitarian Outcomes released its report on some of the ethical dilemmas in Afghanistan. And I think the way in which that, that made the problem so much more concrete, I hope and I think that there's a little bit more buy-in and just a recognition that organizations are going to have to approach their decision-making much more systematically through an ethical lens and that they're going to need guidance and support in doing that. Uh, let's see. I think the two key questions are going to be is, uh, you know, how to actually implement that in, in a way that's helpful in real-time operations. And secondly, the deeper question, that is, why? Why are ethics missing from humanitarian action? I'd like to move on to a, a different topic, and I think we can't talk about 2023 without talking about Gaza, of course. It's raised all kinds of questions about how humanitarianism is practiced. I think we'll look back on Gaza as one of those moments where uh, perhaps, you know, the sector's trajectory was changed quite significantly. And Erwin, just last week, you launched a new newsletter for the new humanitarian called Inklings, shameless plug. And in it, you talk about the Gaza effect. What, what do you mean by that? So thank you for that that plug. Um, I think it's obvious that Gaza matters to everyday people who work within the sector more so than a lot of crises. You know, I think everyone has an opinion on Gaza, even if they're not personally affected, much more so than, say, a crisis like Myanmar, which has been in some form of another seeing humanitarian emergencies for decades. Um, but I think a lot of humanitarians can't find Myanmar on a map and don't realize that it's the same country as Burma. So uh, <laughs> with Gaza, it feels like everyone has has an opinion. And so you see these really intense discussions uh, inside aid organizations, obviously. Early on, it, it brought up a lot of, I think, a renewed focus on the sort of power imbalances between local aid workers and international staff when it comes to safety and priorities. It's brought on a lot of questions about neutrality or humanitarian principles in general, you know, with the focus on 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 UN leaders such as Catherine Russell or Cindy McCain at WFP, who have faced a bit of crit criticism from their own staff about their political allegiances. You know, it's no secret that they had personal ties to the American establishment. But if that's how UN seats are traded among Western powers, then that should be no surprise. But perhaps that, that's just more reason to to re-examine how seats are allocated or or traded, really. And when it comes to to humanitarian principles, it feels like it's more of a mainstream, legitimate discussion because it's happening in an emergency where everyone has an opinion about, as opposed to Myanmar, where I think civil society groups, as Dustin knows, have been trying to get this on the agenda for years. But 
I think people roll their eyes whenever they publish, for example, an op-ed in, in the New Humanitarian about how uh, uh, the international perspectives on aid in Myanmar really have to change. But now that it's happening in Gaza and these same discussions are taking place, I think there's maybe a bit more openness to it. And I'm interested to see how that could play out in the coming weeks. Dustin, on that question of neutrality, you wrote a piece for the New Humanitarian drawing those parallels, right, between Gaza and, and Myanmar and arguing for humanitarian resistance, as you call it. What's changed to your mind this year when it comes to the adherence or the need for or perceived need for adherence to the, the principle of neutrality? Do you think this is a line in the sand? 100%. I think it's been an issue for for longer than just the past year as well, whether it's been the Syria crisis or Myanmar for years and decades, uh, Sudan as well, particularly this year with yeah. the emergency response rooms are a strong example. And yeah, I feel there's a lot of space to really shift the conversation, but also just look at the severe lack of respect for international humanitarian law, human rights law across so many crises across the world. And this kind of illusion of holding to neutrality makes a certain humanitarian actor more morally righteous or better at delivering a response is just incorrect and serves negative purposes as well in a lot of contexts. Uh, in Myanmar, I think and that's a context I know relatively well, we see international humanitarian actors have really lost a lot of their legitimacy across much of the population and have extremely limited access because they're only able to operate in certain areas while you have this oppressive military regime. So why are we kind of holding on to this idea of neutrality when we're facing such horrific acts, whether it's in Gaza, Syria, Sudan, Myanmar, and many other contexts? And so I feel there is a space for not, whether it's rethinking humanitarianism or really revolutionizing it and bringing it up to a bit more of the current context. Uh, I, I agree there's like a space for neutrality, particularly around ICRC, for example, of like, okay, if you want to access prisoners in detention and things like that. But I think that's been extrapolated too far and kind of quietened down a lot of organizations that really have important things to say. And there's also this element, if you are humanitarian actors operating in these really fraught contexts, you also have a position and leverage to be able to use that position to speak to global audiences and influence those audiences. So staying quiet is just horrible. <laughs> you you talked about uh, IHL, and I think the other takeaway from Gaza is that it's been, you know, another nail in the coffin of international humanitarian law in the sense that there are so many overt violations of IHL going unpunished. Nazanin, I wonder what your sense is of, of the impact of that. I mean, we've, we see this time and again in many conflicts. Does this change things in any particular way? One of the takeaways I have of what's going on in Gaza is um, its impact on kind of the reputation of, of the UN. In particular, I mean, we've seen the UN Secretary General taking the extraordinary step of invoking Article 99 of the UN Charter, which basically allows allows him to advise the Security Council you know, grave changes to international peace and security. Of course, you know, he's been calling for an immediate ceasefire, as have many of us, including crisis group. And there's been a lot of pressure on the UN and a lot of criticism of the UN as well. But the fact is that it's going to be the UN that will be needed to pick up the humanitarian pieces in Gaza. So we've kind of never needed the UN more than now. In terms of you know neutrality, I mean, I've been looking at this issue for, for a while now, particularly in the context of the Horn where I work. And I have to say, it is really, really difficult times where neutrality is being questioned more and more. And you know, often, particularly in the context of Somalia, where we saw the country was almost heading towards famine, it was averted, mainly because of the great work that humanitarian organizations were doing. And staying neutral is often not possible when you have to provide life-saving services, you know, and keep these humanitarian corridors open. You know, often humanitarian workers can't avoid working with multiple groups involved in conflicts to save lives. Just recently, we had this horrific attack on an ICRC humanitarian convoy in Khartoum uh, on the 10th of December. It was evacuating civilians from the area. And, you know, it, it's part of a disturbing trend. Of course, you know, it's nothing new, but it is an increasing trend where we are seeing attacks on aid convoys 
humanitarian workers. We're seeing tensions even against the ICRC, which is viewed as a neutral and impartial actor. And these, these attacks are continuing to occur and uh, even escalate uh, in some cases. So these are really, really very, very difficult times. Because you mentioned we're maybe more reliant on the UN than ever, in particular in relation to Gaza. But also the flip side of that is whether it's in Gaza or Myanmar or many other contexts when there are times of relative stability, are we not using that to really strengthen and work with and support extensively local, domestic, national, humanitarian systems and actors that in the case of Myanmar, in the case of Gaza, are highly active and have a lot of presence in communities. So yes, maybe there is a reliance now, but that's because we've backed ourselves into that corner in times of relative stability. And how can we use times of relative stability or times of crisis to really shift away from this idea that the UN can be this like last resort and is ultimately has the scale? How can we create the scale with local and domestic and national humanitarian systems? I totally agree with you. Um, I think there has to be more investment. Obviously, Gaza is a very difficult and unique case. But what I was talking about was that we've seen the horrific damage in Gaza. Uh, We've seen the devastation across the country. And also, we we know that we have a huge displaced population. And it's going to take more than just the UN. Of course, it's going to take local partners. It's going to take regional countries. It's going to take a lot. Everyone come together to help the Palestinian people. Um, The UN can't do it alone. Uh, No one can do it alone. The UN is still going to have to play an important role. There's no doubt about that. Hi, this is Bashar Ahmed um, from Shebeka. The traditional humanitarian sector needs to acknowledge and collaborate with the broader ecosystem of actors, such as mutual aid groups, diaspora and migrant humanitarians. These actors have the capacity, legitimacy and agility to respond effectively and efficiently to the changing realities on the ground. However, risk averse donors, UN and INGOs are not prepared yet. Many prefer to keep hold of the purse tightly, even though they know they can't provide or deliver this humanitarian assistance. For example, in Sudan, many of them remain largely missing in action in terms of uh, responding to the crisis there. And even if they have the budgets, they cannot spend it uh, efficiently necessarily. So I think there's a lot to be taken into consideration on that. Listen, to to pick up on your point here about shifting from perhaps a a UN first or international organization first model towards supporting locally led efforts in talking to probably about a dozen people about this episode and this question about how humanitarian aid and, and response has changed most significantly in 2023, I don't think anything was mentioned more than the increasingly key role that mutual aid networks have played in, in humanitarian response in 2023. You mentioned the emergency response rooms in Sudan. Another shameless plug, we did an episode on that with uh, someone from an emergency response room and an OCHA uh, humanitarian officer. You also argue that outside of just Sudan, this is locally led efforts and response is something that's increased quite effectively in Myanmar in 2023. How so? Yeah, I think the international system is extremely constrained in Myanmar. It was over the past decade plus, and those restrictions have just increased. So you've seen a lot of the like, grassroots networks really reactivated since the, immediately after the coup in 2021. They've just gone from strength to strength, uh, working across the country in many quite amazing ways. And there, there has been some minor donor movement in providing some direct funding to some of these actors. And then you've seen, it's basically a networks of networks model because I I agree there's this kind of challenge of like, how do you scale things? And Nazanin is totally correct. There are huge amounts of need across many different contexts. But there's also, I think we can fall into this trap of like, oh, civil society or or the state for that matter in a lot of global South or crisis affected countries can't absorb funding or the support that needs to be delivered to address the various needs. But Myanmar's quite an amazing template of just this network upon network upon network working across different 
ethnic ministered areas, through military controlled areas, and really being able to reach a lot of these communities with, it can even be small, like micro-based grants or emergency funds on all different levels. And so how can you kind of replicate this network of network place? And over the past few years since the coup, Myanmar has really, from some excellent civil society leaders, not particularly visible, and this is part of the difficulty is that they're doing excellent work because of the sensitivities. They don't really want to be visible doing that work because it's insecure to do so. And so the best work doesn't get seen, but they're really able to absorb a lot of funding, absorb much more funding, and kind of create this replicating model that reaches the most hard to reach places. But nobody really hears about it in the international system because it doesn't reach any kind of news, but is is quite profound. That said, I do think one of the things that has changed this year is this concept of mutual aid, which I think in the humanitarian sector, we first started hearing about in the context of the refugee response in Europe. And at that time, it felt like a very isolated situation that needed an exceptional kind of solution. Now it feels like it's become a thing that is a long-term presence or that is seen as part of the ecosystem and that the the formal sector needs to engage with. So I think that's been a change from the way mutual aid has been referred to in the past. You know, I agree with, say, for example, Sudan, the emergency rooms are really interesting, really unique. And I think what's changed is that the international sector wants to engage and is engaging. But are they doing that because they don't have their own access? And when they get access, are they just going to go back to the usual ways of working. I think it's a danger in that even in Sudan, which the emergency room committees are not NGOs in the traditional way that local NGOs would identify and be set up. But in order to engage with the international community and access funding, they're speaking the language of the international community and sort of on the surface, at least replicating those models more and more. So I'm just wondering if over the long term, if this is a flash in the pan as far as the international interest is concerned and when they get access again, things go back to normal or do they view them as an extension do they become in marketing materials our partners, that kind of thing, even though they are anything but? So that's that's my question about mutual aid groups. I think I see them as quite unique and the international community's engagement with them is very unique. But where does it all lead to? Does it actually just lead to being absorbed into the same system? But I think the difference is that now, you know, you've got Myanmar, you've got Sudan, you've got Gaza. So it's no longer that the constraints on access is the exception, it's increasingly becoming the rule and thus to my mind, mutual aid increasingly becomes the norm. But yes, to be seen, I suppose. How much of the idea of mutual aid also just ties back to neoliberal evisceration of the state by World Bank and IMF reform structural adjustment programs over decades. So the idea of mutual aid, like I think it's excellent, obviously, but then how much is that just replacing the state that has been eviscerated? And how can we also look at, and this is what ODI is really trying to research over the next coming years, our own plug, is where does the state fit into this? Yes, not in a context uh, like Myanmar, where the pseudo state of the military is oppressive, but also after you've had decades of like reducing the state, where can the state get back in? And mutual aid isn't just replacing the state, but can work towards having this kind of systemic approach to building resilience, building, you know, crisis response, et cetera. And we are seeing in, in more and more context also the, the state wanting more control over uh, humanitarian response. And even with the earthquake in Morocco, you know, the state being much more present and forceful, I think, in determining what kind of aid it receives and doesn't receive. So that that I think is another shift to, to keep an eye on and potentially that the sector is going to have to engage with a bit more intentionally. To your point, Dustin, I think even in the actual political philosophy of what mutual aid is, I don't think it's so much just plugging holes, but of also modeling how a future state can actually run itself. It seems, whether it's in Sudan or Myanmar, that a lot of change is happening outside of the international aid system, perhaps more than inside of it. And I wonder if 2023 is a year in which the international humanitarian system is prepared to support uh, locally led efforts versus perhaps being at the center of humanitarian, at the, the nucleus of humanitarian response? Is this a more systemic shift basically in the culture of how the aid sector sees itself? I wouldn't necessarily see it as a shift to local response because they've been talking about this for years. And if it would have happened, it should have happened by now, I suppose. But 
What I do see, which is related, is the sector more and more acknowledging that it is not the answer for everything. This week, the UN released its Global Humanitarian Overview, which is a bird's eye view of what aid will cost or what the sector claims it will cost in the next year. And it's slightly less than what it was last year, the first time it's gone down in years. Throughout the report and through the the talking notes from Martin Griffiths around it, it's about, well, the humanitarian sector can't do all of this. We can't step in for development actors. can't be expected to do more with less. They have to, in some ways, do less with less. There's fewer people targeted. Uh, they're much more focused on life-saving needs. I think there was one part where Martin Griffiths is talking specifically about, you know, development actors have to do their part, which is a message from humanitarians that humanitarians have been saying this whole time. So as part of that, I think there is that recognition that, okay, well, maybe it's not all up to us as a humanitarian aid sector. So if they can acknowledge that so keenly here, and to be sure it's a message to the donors who are funding them less, but I think they can also recognize that, well, a lot of that being not up to us, us being the international humanitarian aid sector, means that it's also up to grassroots groups and the organic aid that already exists on the ground. I remember after COVID, somebody saying humanitarian solutions represent a sliver of what the world needs right now. Uh, It needs economic support. It needs debt relief, as you were talking about earlier, Dustin. It needs welfare systems and that the humanitarians are a bit player in all this. And that that recognition existed at the time, but it didn't actually translate into a different way of being for humanitarians. And I think this latest humanitarian appeal is the first time we've actually seen humanitarians say, as a result of this recognition that we are a bit player, we're going to scale down rather than continue to scale up. So that's really interesting. One thing I'm hearing a lot of is not just, as we just heard, that humanitarians are having to do less or are being forced to do less with a lot less. But also what I'm hearing increasingly is that particularly donors are asking for a lot more accountability as well. Just in the the past year, we've had several aid scandals in Somalia and Ethiopia. This has had a big impact, I would say. Uh, on the feeling that there has to be a lot more accountability now, particularly because of these tough financial times. And I just wonder, when we're talking about community-based mutual aid groups, you know, of course, they're playing a really important role, particularly in Sudan. And you know, we've seen mutual aid in the context of, of Somalia as well, particularly when, when there are droughts and communities coming together to, to help each other. And volunteers too. But again, when we're, when we're thinking about accountability and maybe partnering with these mutual aid organizations and groups and communities, I just wonder whether this feeling of um, accountability and um, you know the fears over corruption, et cetera, and will have an impact on that. I, I'm not sure. I'm just putting that question out there, but just wondering whether this will hinder this kind of partnership mentality. Shameless plug alert. We just did on our other podcast that Erwin actually co-hosts, What's Unsaid, an episode on this topic, no? It's great that you brought that up. I think it goes to this issue of trust. At the UN General Assembly this year, rebuilding trust in the international system was one of the big themes. But I think it goes for the actual international humanitarian system. It, It goes beyond that. I think there's an erosion of trust within the system. And chief among them are staff and donors. Donors do not trust traditional international aid groups to be careful with their money. And I think you see evidence of that in high earmarking of funds. IOM, something like 97% of their funding is earmarked for specific projects. There's no leeway for them to shift when big crises hit. You see that in anti-corruption initiatives. They're being forced to take on WFPs had scandals, UNHCR is promoting a new anti-corruption initiative, and all this talk of efficiency, the Global Humanitarian Overview is a message to donors. It's not a message to the public. It's a fundraising message to donors that you can trust us with this money because they realize right now they're not being trusted. So that is an issue for local groups because if donors can't trust the international system, then it's going to be even harder to trust local groups they do not know and have not trusted for years in effect. But I see it as 
an opportunity for people outside the traditional system, philanthropy groups, private sector, middlemen coming up who are specialized in vetting. I could see that taking on a more prominent role. We've seen that in Ukraine. I, I think there's just an opportunity for all these people who we don't think of as being part of the quote unquote international aid sector to be part of it. I was really surprised when the EU temporarily suspended funding for the World Food Programme in Somalia during what was the height of the drought and when the WFP was already struggling to you know, feed people pouring into the camps, but also obviously to reach those people in harder areas controlled by al-Shabaab. And then they temporarily suspended funding. So you can just see that it's more than accountability. It's they're actually doing something about this as well, um, the donors. And it's going to become very, very difficult to basically, as you say, to rebuild that kind of trust. The other thing that I think this points to in terms of trends, and this isn't new, but I, I think it has increased this year as a result of the scandals you talked about, Nazanin, but also as a result of, of Gaza, is this kind of gap between what's best to do in terms of humanitarian principles and then the political imperatives. So cutting off funding, which uh, I think most humanitarians would argue isn't actually in the interest of humanitarian principles, but is it a response to needing to appease the public for politicians who have a hard line on value for money? We see it in terms of where money is going. And, and again, this year was a year in which one crisis kind of overshadows all the others and where funding is directed in order to kind of solve political problems rather than because that's where the need is greatest. And then I think we see it in the growing gap between technocrats who are trying to hold the line on applying humanitarian principles and their own politicians. And, and Gaza has certainly been divisive in that regard, too, where the humanitarians have a very different point of view from their own um, foreign ministers or others on how best to approach the situation. So I think overall, this kind of politicization of aid and, and where that comes into conflict with humanitarian principles has been, I think, on display once again in 2023. There's been this kind of decades of economic growth focused economic development that will bring peace, that will bring stability without dealing with political issues. Yes, and that's not just Gaza. Obviously, that's a very poignant example. But then across Myanmar, across Cambodia, across many parts of sub-Saharan Africa, there's such a focus on economic development at the expense of political issues. So I, I would almost call for aid as a broader concept to be re-politicized mm. and look at how do we address these deep, persistent political challenges. Afghanistan is another you could add to that list. Yeah. You know, when it comes to funding and politicization of aid, you know, with Gaza, I think independence is really in question for anyone operating. And so if all your major donors are supporting one side, I think the veneer of independence really starts to wear a little thin. And it's someone everyone already knows. But I think it's just because with the focus on Gaza, it's become clear. You know, on rethinking, the podcast has in the past years really looked at different ways of funding the system. So I'm in the same way that internal questions about Gaza are sort of maybe opening the door to a more serious conversation about the principles like neutrality. Does Gaza spark a new urgency to sort of revamp how the humanitarian system itself is funded? Mm. And some of these outlandish ideas that Oxfam and others have proposed in past years where people go, oh, yeah, that's that's a nice idea. Great. Maybe it pushes others to, to think about it a little bit more seriously. If you can say that you truly are independent because you do not take money from certain governments, then does that not make your job easier? Hello, this is Dave Hartman. I'm the senior manager for Flexport.org. In 2023, Flexport.org supported NGOs in shipping aid to 70 countries, including Ukraine, Sudan, Lebanon, Ethiopia, and Syria. When we think of aid delivery, we think of it in the most literal sense, the delivery of aid cargo like NFIs or wash items, food aid, shelter kits, whatever it may be to those in need. And as I'm sure all the listeners know, in 2023, it felt like we had a new disaster every single day. Uh, so we saw many organizations that have traditionally focused on development activities shift into emergency response to address the growing need for humanitarian aid and as a response as well to pressure from their donors to get involved in these new crises. But the pace of new disasters makes it particularly difficult to anticipate where the next one will be and to build out those partnerships in advance. 
Uh, this is forcing organizations to build out uh, these new partnerships to supplement their capabilities on the fly. We work with more than 100 nonprofit partners, and we've seen firsthand a misalignment between organizations that have cargo and organizations that have staff on the ground and can implement a response and get items to those in need. Basically, there's a mismatch between supply and demand. We expect the trend to continue as we see both development and humanitarian response organizations with severely strained budgets, given both just the donor environment and the number of disasters that we have globally. Uh, and so continuing to build strong partnerships and robust networks will be critical for humanitarian aid work. Gaza 2023 in general has sparked a lot of debate about what has changed or needs to change in the sector. But to be fair, there are a few things that I think people in the sector like to discuss more than what needs to change. And as you mentioned, we've been talking about how to rethink the sector on this podcast alone for four seasons now. But was 2023 particularly different, do you think, in terms of events that have led us to to rethink how the sector does its job? Is there anything special about 2023? Or is this just another year-end conversation about, you know, what has and hasn't happened and what we're hoping for the next year? <laughs> I mean, for me, anyway, working, obviously, uh, based in Nairobi and working um, for a long time on Africa, I feel like there is far more recognition from the humanitarian agencies about you know the connections between various climate shocks, conflict, displacement, food insecurity across the region. This interconnectedness is coming up a lot more, and also because of Ukraine and because you know vulnerabilities of uh, local international supply chains and how interconnected we are in terms of. Um, food security. For me, it's it's positive that we're we're making these connections, but it's not enough. We need to then do something with these with these connections and we need to be working closer together. And as you said, you know, humanitarian development need to be working hand in hand to fill some of these gaps. Well somebody's got to fill it, you know. What I find interesting is the internal dynamics within aid organizations. You can talk about high high level policy all you want. We all know that things change quite slowly, but it feels different with some of the internal dynamics. And so I wonder if that in itself is a small catalyst for change, even just a little bit. Not everyone, probably not any UN agency, but perhaps there are some bigger aid groups who who shift the way they do things, or at least realize that their staff actually do have an opinion. Because I do think there is a bit of a divide in how well, there's a very big divide in how international aid staff might see things such as the principles versus various local aid staff in, in different countries, different organizations. And I think Gaza exposes some of that. And I'm, I'm interested to see how that plays out in shifting the way humanitarian organizations not necessarily change, but view change and how they view the possibility of changing, that things don't have to be the exact way they've always been because right now that's causing problems internally. So what what are other ways to do things differently? And it feels like that mirrors a broader shift in the world and in geopolitics with the global South rising, to use that term that everyone hates in the context of Africa rising. But, you know, that we're seeing the center of power shifting within aid organizations. They're certainly shifting. Yeah, I think there's huge repercussions. And I think the U.S. and a lot of allies are getting basically blindly behind supporting genocide. There is a real lack of recognizing how, what the impact that has at a global level and the repercussions are immense that what legitimacy Western states had is really come crushing down even further. And yeah, I don't like to talk necessarily of the rise of particular countries, but you see some excellent leadership from maybe unexpected places such as Malaysia, Indonesia, really coming forth with quite principled and strong positions on Myanmar, on Gaza. And I think that is exciting in terms of this broader shifting of power and shifting of narratives. And that's kind of a bit hopeful. I was also last week speaking with some state humanitarian actors from the Philippines and just their describing of their whole humanitarian architecture, the domestic funding, how they have different funds for different stages of the response and earlier recovery. Uh, it was just beautifully outlaid by these Philippine government staff. 
Philippines doesn't get much attention in the news anymore because it's so effectively dealing with its typhoon after typhoon. So I think there is potential shifts, not just from different countries contributing towards narratives, but also countries showing actually we can do a humanitarian response much better without international actors coming in and imposing whether it's certain values or certain ways of doing things. And that's that's exciting on many levels. This last question is for all of you. We've just discussed 2023. We're a couple of weeks away from 2024. What do you all think that the most urgent rethink of humanitarianism will be for 2024? I mean, I think every, everything revolves around money. It's not going to happen on, on the 1st of January, but over the medium term, where does the money come from? How much do things actually cost? Do you even need to be there? Is it you that has to be doing it? And are you going to put your logo on it anyways? I think those are all questions that the humanitarian sector should and can ask and can make some changes on. Uh, I'll be a bit boring, maybe coming out of a development studies PhD, but I'd say tax. Tax is really critical to funding, whether it's the Western donor countries, which ideally we get away from that, but then across global south, across crisis affected countries, taxing wealth, taxing extraction, taxing inequalities, addressing inequalities. That's where humanitarian crises need to be addressed. And there's been some movement on that front in terms of a push for uh, tax reform. So maybe some good news on the horizon. Yeah, I mean, for me, obviously, looking at this from a climate and conflict point of view, I think it's going to be really important how aid agencies are going to deal with this kind of cycle of climate shocks, drought and flooding, you know, coupled with conflicts. And will the loss and damages fund that was agreed to at COP28 be able to fill some of the gaps in terms of responding to these kinds of disasters? You know, particularly important for countries like Somalia. But on the other hand, despite the strong effects of climate change in Kenya, for example, Kenya is classified, according to this fund, as a lower middle income economy, which could potentially discredit them from qualifying for funds. Similarly, for other countries uh, affected, like Zimbabwe as well, which uh, is going through, through a drought. So just dealing with climate action and trying to deal with, you know, disaster risks, assistance, and then also climate rehabilitation, et cetera, and reconstruction after these kinds of disasters that we see. I think that's going to be a big, big question mark for me for 2024. Well, quite a year, uh, both in terms of, of mega crises like Gaza, but also in terms of some of those real shifts that we're seeing as, as we've been discussing. So thank you, Erwin, Dustin, Nazanin, for helping us uh, make sense of the past 12 months and, and look forward to the year ahead. It's great to have you on the show. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much. Thank you so much. Nazanin Moshiri is International Crisis Group's Senior Analyst for Climate, Environment and Conflict in Africa. Erwin Loy is a new humanitarian senior policy editor, and Dustin Barter is a senior research fellow at the Humanitarian Policy Group. We're keen to hear your thoughts on these topics. What were your main takeaways from 2023? How should we think about aid and humanitarian response differently in 2024? Are there ways humanitarianism is already being thought about or practiced differently that you'd like us to explore on the podcast? You know where to reach us, podcast at thenewhumanitarian.org. Rethinking Humanitarianism will be back in January. In the meantime, do look out for our editor's picks of top stories from the past year, as well as our annual and much anticipated list of top trends driving humanitarian crises. You'll find all that on our website, thenewhumanitarian.org. And today, we'll leave you with one last voice note. This one is from Elias Sagmeister. He's an independent consultant and non-resident fellow at the Global Public Policy Institute. And for Elias, 2023 was yet another year of the humanitarian sector painting a bleak picture of the world, a picture that he argues is inaccurate. For 2024, Elias lays out a more optimistic vision of a sector that celebrates the advancements it's made in reducing human suffering and more accurately measures needs moving forward. This podcast is a production of The New Humanitarian. This episode was hosted by me, Heba Ali, and my partner in crime, Melissa Fundira. Melissa also produced and edited the episode. Original music by Whitney Patterson and sound engineering by Nick Tuttle. Thank you for listening to Rethinking Humanitarianism. See you in the new year.
In 2022, the UN-led appeal described the situation of escalating needs and funding requirements as unprecedented, at record levels and skyrocketing. For 2023, the same words applied. Martin Griffiths himself called it a déjà vu all over again and predicted it will be déjà vu all over again this time next year as well. Well, he was right. Again, the 2024 appeal paints a dire picture and uses much of the same hyperbole. This is at odds with the development of the world over the past decades. Despite the dramatic current disasters and an increase in state-based wars, the world has seen darker times. Uh, more people used to die from natural disasters, not less. More people used to live in poverty and hunger, not less. And yes, attacks on aid workers are at an all-time high, but surely this needs to be put into perspective with the ever-growing number of aid workers. The aid sector has never been better resourced. It has grown over 80% in the past six years alone. It has professionalized and has achieved a lot, and it deserves credit for its contribution to some of the more positive trends we're seeing. I hope that for the future, we will find better ways of assessing needs at the global level and communicating them more honestly. And with luck, 2024 just might bring us a step closer to a realistic narrative about the world, the humanitarian achievements and ambitions, rather than the same doomsday déjà vu all over again. <laughs>